of kt, the correlation kernel, chi bar a on this extended L2 space. So we have little l2 of n1 through nm. So that's set times z. Okay. And of course, the interesting thing is the correlation kernel. So the correlation kernel is n i x i n j x j. Now it's an it's an extended kernel. Of course, it's got four components. Um, it's minus q to the n j minus n i x i x j indicator function n i less than n j. So that's that's the kind of easy part. And plus the summation k equals one to n j of psi n i n i minus k x i phi n j n j minus k of x j. Okay, good. Whew. Now the size the size you know what they are. They're, they're just over there. Um, but let me write them out because here k is positive, and if k is positive, well, let's look. If, if k is positive, then f, is my, f has a negative thing. If f has a negative thing, then there's, no, there's actually no pole at, my, at 1 anymore. So you can get rid of the 1. That's just, just a comment. 0 over 1 over 2 pi i to 1 over gamma 0. Uh, dw, 1 minus w over w to the k. It's maybe written a tiny bit different, but it's almost the same thing. Over um, w to the x minus x0. N minus, oh, N minus k uh, plus 1. OK, great. So, so, so the size are just those things, and uh, everything looks fine except what are the phi's? That's the problem. So the Q is the same yeah, the Q, Q is that. Why is there a power of Q? Q is zero or one, right? So. Uh, so that's Q. You think of as a matrix. And you take that matrix to that power, and then you evaluate it there. And uh, n j is bigger than n i, so you don't have to worry about it. the power is negative. Okay. Uh, I'm sort of, I'll have to erase that, I think. Okay, but what about the phi's? Uh, maybe I'll write it here. Okay. Oh, here's the problem. Phi satisfies one and two. So, so these are the, con these are, these are, the phi's are not explicit. They're biorthogonal functions to the size. Psi n k x phi n l of x is equal to the indicator function. K is equal to l. That's, the, that's how the phi's are supposed to be that, and they're supposed to be polynomials. Is a polynomial of degree k. Great, that's the answer. Well, this came because you you had to invert some matrix and you don't know how to invert it, so you encode that in these things being bi orthogonal. Okay, so once again, your initial data is encoded in the size. There it is. There's your initial data. Then you produce these psi functions, and you are asked to biorthogonalize them by finding these functions, which are polynomials of the right degree, and then build the kernel out of it. And that kernel tells you what's the probabilities. Okay? And of course, I think everybody in this room can see the problem with this. How on earth are you going to do it? Okay. In fact, uh, they were this, this, 
the, the, the phi's were known in one case. And actually, you can kind of see it already here. If you look at this thing, the first thing you're going to ask yourself is maybe there's some case where it's toplets, right? And of course, it's toplets if the x's just look like, like i or minus i, and the y's look like minus i as well, right? So of course, if, if, if x sub if x of i is just minus i and y of i is minus i, of course, that's a toplets matrix, and then you can start solving, right? Everyone goes, yeah. So if it's toplets, you're in, you're in really good luck, but of course, it's a special case. So if it's a toplets, uh, so for step initial data, well, another thing to see about the formula, actually, this is kind of interesting. Notice, notice the big N doesn't appear very explicitly in the formula. It's very weakly dependent on big N. Okay, for step initial data. No, it doesn't. It it just doesn't depend on big N. That's because particles don't feel the particles behind them. So if you're asking about the first N particles, they just don't. They don't care about all those other particles back there. Now, now, of course, <laughs> I mean, that doesn't mean that you can get away with just stopping here, right? Because these ends may not be the first couple of m's. That's not where you want to look, right? So don't, don't get that impression. OK, for step initial data, you actually can just compute. You can, you can guess them, basically, which is what they did. And it's, uh, it's this. Zero. DW over. It, it almost looks like the same thing as the size. Well, to the uneducated eye, it's, you, know, you can hardly tell the difference. E to the TW, you just get that. OK. So, so it was known for that case and, and, a, and a couple of other cases. It turns out if you, any time you put um, the particles periodically in a box, you can, you can get a formula like this. OK? Well, that's it. That's where it stopped. in. Uh, around that period. OK, 246. So, so now we're, so, so probably, I, I'm going to actually, so, so, so last summer we discovered how to get the phi's, which is what I'm going to show you probably next class. OK. Um, what I want to do now is I want to give you a calculation which will give you some intuition about how this comes about. OK. So, so first of all, we know that if we start with step initial data, then we're supposed to get the ARI process, right? And that's how the ARI process was obtained, roughly. OK, so if we take a, so the ARI process, I won't go through the details of the calculation, but I'll tell you roughly the results. So we take the 1, 2, 3 scaling limit, so 1, 2, 3 scaling limit. So if you remember, that's. Um, H epsilon Tx is this epsilon to the 1 half, H2 epsilon to the minus 3 halves T, uh, 2 epsilon to the minus 1 X plus epsilon to the minus 3 halves T. So we want to take that scaling limit of the H's. Now, now our thing is written in terms of X's, but that's OK. H, H T Z is just basically the inverse function of the x's. Ah, sorry. So x's and z's are basically the same thing, just in, in term, inverse functions. And um, here, H, um, 
zero um, x. Well, that's just you have step initial data, and so your initial thing looks like this wedge. And now under this rescaling, the wedge collapses down to a narrow wedge. That's the <laughs> narrow wedge. Okay. And h epsilon 1x is supposed to go to the area 2 process minus a parabola. OK, so, well, I, I won't go through the details. You have to ask what's the probability that this is less than some things, which turns into the probability that x's are greater than some complicated expression, right, involving epsilon to the minus 3 halves. And you plug in that, and you make this sum, which can actually be done and turned into one contour integral. And then you take the limit of the kernels, OK, and you do it by steepest descent and you get the following formula. Oops. So you get the probability that the Harry 2 process of x1 plus or equal to g1 is equal to the determinant of i minus chi g k extended very chi g on L2 of g1 gn cross r. And with this extended airy kernel, and the extended airy kernel, k extended airy of u1, xc1, u2, c2 is equal to the integral of zero to infinity, lambda minus lambda, u1 minus u2. Airy. And now this is the airy function. It's a lambda, it's integral t lambda. And this is for u1 bigger than u2, bigger equal, and um, minus to zero. OK, so this is just another one of these awful formulas. So that's, that's the formula for the area process you get by just taking a limit of this particular special solution which they found. Okay. And, yeah. Yeah, that, that's what I said. So let me just repeat. Um, it, think of that special initial data. And then this thing just looks like i or n minus i or something like that, right? And then. Suppose you just ask for the y's also to be like that special type of initial data, OK? Then you see this, ma this matrix become toplets, OK? And then you have all the toplets tricks. You solve it, and then after the fact, once you see this machine, uh, of course, that, that's Johansson's calculation. But after the fact, once you see the machine, you can guess what's the phi's, which make that work, OK? So any, if you put the, if you have a, finite box, and you put the particle periodically in the box, this trick works, OK? And you, you can get a phi like that. So uh, you can also imagine how to get the area 1 process. So you put the particle periodically every 2 in a box, right? And then you do this scaling, and you let the box go to infinity, and then take the limit, and you'll get the area 1 process, OK? So that's why those are the only ones they could do, because it's really the only phi you knew. All right. 
Okay. But I just, I want to end by showing you that there's, there's another version of this. Okay. So there's a, there's a problem with these, um, with these type of, of formulas. And the problem is, is that the formula's complexity depends on n. Or maybe m. Well, I wrote m over there and I wrote m here. It's the same thing, right? So uh, we would like a formula. Remember, I wanted a formula for the probability that the area process is less than a function everywhere. Okay? And it's obviously going to be kind of hard to do it from this formula because the, the dimension's increasing. Okay? So there's a better formula you can use for that. Okay. You'll see why next class, why we want a formula for it. It'll become extremely apparent why you want a formula for something less than something. Okay. So there's a path integral version of this. It's also equal to the determinant of i minus k area. Now, k area, th this is the original area kernel, which is just what you get here if you put u1 equals u2. OK? Well, u1 equals u2, then you're in this formula. This guy goes away, and you just get the area kernel. OK, so that's called k area. Plus. And now I have chi bar. There's a reason these things get inverted. E to the x0 minus x1 h chi g2 bar e to the x1 minus x2 h. And you keep, keep going. Here, chi bar gn e to the xn minus x0 h k area. But now this one's just on L2 of R. That's the beauty of this formula. Now this formula, actually this formula, strangely, this formula predates this formula because the way I'm telling things isn't completely historically correct. The formula, that this thing was happening at roughly the same time that um, Prahoffer and Spahn were trying to derive the area process. And the way they did it was different. And actually, they arrived at this formula. But then they heard about all this other stuff, and so they, they rewrote it like this. Okay? And then everyone forgot about this formula. But this formula is the good one. Okay. Why is it good? Oh, here, H. Uh, I didn't say what's H. H is the area operator. Well, everything's called area here, sorry. Minus d squared plus x. It's the area operator. Okay. So, so this is um, a formula. Now, um, one thing about this formula, you you notice it's cyclic in the variables. Okay. You see x zero minus x one, x one minus x two, etc. But then it goes back, and then this one, this one's funny. Now remember, they're in order, right? So x zero minus x one is negative. Right. And this is minus d squared. So this is, a, this is a fair game heat equation applied to this, right? Okay, This is the heat equation in the right direction, because it's x0 is less than x1, but then there's minus d squared. So that's fine. But then, at the end, something goes horribly wrong. And you go loop all the way back, and you have to apply the heat equation backwards for this whole time xn minus x0. Okay. And that's just intrinsic in this problem. Well, of course, you were told when you were a baby, you were never allowed to solve the heat equation backwards. But as I showed to you last time, if you apply the heat equation to area functions, it works both ways. And this thing's being acting on area functions inside here, so it's fine. Actually, this is it's just fine. You can just compute this. OK? So although it looks bad, it's perfectly legal. And the thing makes perfect sense as a uh, kernel. All right. So I have like uh, five minutes. Okay. Okay. Now the other nice thing about this formula, so we'll mostly see this next time, I guess, is that it's kind of clear how to take a scaling limit of this formula. A scale by a scaling limit, I mean I want to know what's the probability the area process is less than some function g. So maybe if I'm in some box, 
I want to know what's the probability the area function is less than some function g. Okay? What you do is you just put in lots of fine points, x0 through xn, into the box, and you solve this, and then you make your mesh size go to zero. But look at what this thing's asking. It keeps cutting off all the values higher than gn, and then applying this uh, e to the delta now, h. So you, you cut off high values, everything above gn, and then you, you, you apply e to the delta h, and then you cut off high values and apply e to the delta h. But what is that? All that is, is it means you're solving along this box e to, you're, you're solving the equation uh, dtu equals hu, or minus, sorry, etu equals minus hu, with a boundary condition of g, with Dirichlet boundary conditions there. That's all that it means. So you can just look at this equation, you can immediately see what the limit is with a fine mesh of x's. Okay? And what's chi bar? Chi bar just means cut off everything less than the value. Okay? So here, it, once again, I'll say it. You, without you know, closing your eyes to the little problem down here, <laughs> um, you, you, you cut off all values above g, solve a little bit of h, minus h, cut off all values. So you're basically just solving a heat equation with this potential x. Well, the potential becomes minus x. So you're solving a heat equation with the potential minus x with Dirichlet boundary condition on your function g. That's, that's actually what you're doing. Okay, so that's what's beautiful about that formula. The other thing, and this is where I'll end, is that this is a very, very, very general fact. So these extended kernels pretty much always have representations like this. There's a way to go back and forth. So I'll write you the version here. Uh, as Craig said, that's because you're free fermions. <laughs> I, I defer to you, yes? Do you want to explain that? Okay. Well, you wouldn't have formulas with which to make this in ASAP. So I'm saying you wouldn't get either side naturally in ASAP. Okay, so the only claim I'm making is that extended kernel formulas like this, coming from kernels like that, can very generally be written like this, where you just have to say what's the thing that goes here and what's the thing that goes here. Okay, so let me show you the one for, for TASAP. So it, in other words, all I'm claiming is that this formula, just like that one, there's a way to rewrite it on L2 of Z in the following way. OK, so let me just write it. So just write equals determinant of I minus K T N M. Now this is just this is just that K T, this is this is K T N M dot N M dot. OK? You just put NMs in both positions, and then you call it that. It's the one-point version of the guy. And then you get, OK, it's, it's not, you have to believe me that these two things are, are roughly the same, but Q to the N1 minus NM, chi uh, A1, I called it A here, yeah, Q n2 minus n1 chi a2 q to the n m minus n m minus 1 chi a m. But now it's on little l2 of z. OK? OK, so the propagator here is this q. Remember what's q? OK? And that thing plays the role of this guy. And you've got your KT at the one-point distribution, which is this 
analog of this K airy. And um, then you keep cutting off. Here you cut off above. Okay? So you're solving it above with a boundary condition at these A's. Okay? Now, now Q, Q may not look like, a, um, like, like you're solving the heat equation or anything. Q is this indicator function of x greater than y. But there's a trick, and the trick is that if you conjugate the formula, remember the formulas are invariant up to conjugations. If you conjugate the formula by 2 to the x, then the Q just becomes 2 to the y minus x. There. That's all the result of conjugation by, by 2 to the x. Okay? But now it's a probability transition function. This is now just the transition probabilities of a geometric random walk jumping down. Okay? So now this thing looks like heat equation. And then cut off. Well, cut off, heat equation, cut off, heat equation, cut off, heat equation. Well, for random walks in terms of the heat equation. Okay? But of course, once again, you've got this weird guy, right? Who wants it to solve it backwards in time for time n, n minus n1 at the end. Okay? But you can do that. So why don't I stop there, and next time I'll show you how these two pieces can be put together to solve the whole thing. Oh, this, this. Yeah, yeah. So this equals that, and just like that one equals that one. It's just the same sort of thing. Yeah? So usually when you have like a path integral formulation, you have some trajectory, and you chop it up in small, like equal distance bits, and then you have a propagator for each one. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, okay, so first of all, um, I would rather do this, right? Because then it, then it looks like Brownian motions, okay? But actually, to change, um, to, to get rid of that potential is very easy because it just turns into a parabolic shift of the Brownian motions up to some trivial factors, okay? So the, after you do that, the propagator of this is just Brownian motion. So all I have is a Brownian motion path, okay? But it gets killed whenever it goes above G. You see, it propagates the Brownian, well, forget that, sorry. <laughs> you have to close your eyes there <laughs> for a second. So the Brownian motion comes in and goes backwards in time for a while. Okay, don't worry about that. And then, and then, <laughs> Um, gets killed when it goes above G, propagates a bit forward. Just think of these as deltas, right? A little bit of, so I solved Brownian motion for a little bit of time, killed when it goes above G, and as you take this delta goes to zero, all it is is a Brownian motion kills when, killed when it goes above G. So you can just take this formula and you can just rewrite it explicitly in terms of a kernel, which is just Brownian motion starting at some point and ending at some point and killed when it goes above G. Well, G plus a parabola. Okay. So, so I should be thinking of the, the like, function or something, and then we have these other functions that are the cutoff. Yeah, so here, what, what, what the formula tells you is that if you want to know the probability that TASEP is bigger than AJ at some points, all you do is you take a geometric walk, right, and go from here to here, at, these are the variables which are hiding inside this operator, um, being killed when it goes below this A, okay? And then it goes backwards in time for a while, don't worry about that. <laughs> and, and that's what the kernel is. Okay? Does that make, is that what you were asking? Well, chi, chi A is the indicator function that X is bigger than A. So here, you, you solve, and then you kill everything below A. Chi A is just the indicator function is X bigger than A. I, if I didn't write it, I wrote it last time, I'm sorry. So Chi A.
chi bar is just one minus chi. Yeah. So you, you kill, you, you, you only let things be around when x is bigger than a, and then you propagate a bit. And then, does that make sense? Okay. Any, anybody else? Sorry. Okay. <laughs> 